Saint Mary Magdalene, penitent, contemplative, La Sainte Baume, I, France. The family of Lazarus. The father of Lazarus was named Zara, or Zira, and was of very noble Egyptian descent. He had dwelt in Syria, on the confines of Arabia, where he held a position under the Syrian king. But for services rendered in war, he received from the Roman emperor property near Jerusalem and in Galilee. He was like a prince, and was very rich. He had acquired still greater wealth by his wife Jezebel, a Jewess of the sect of the Pharisees. He became a Jew, and was pious and strict according to the Pharisaical laws. He owned part of the city on Mount Zion, on the side upon which the brook near the height on which the temple stands, flows through the ravine. But the greater part of this property, he had bequeathed to the temple, retaining, however, in his family some ancient privilege on its account. This property was on the road by which the apostles went up to the Senecal, but the Senecal itself formed no longer a part of it. Zara's castle in Britannia was very large. It had numerous gardens, terraces, and fountains, and was surrounded by double ditches. The prophecies of Anna and Simeon were known to the family of Zara, who were waiting for the Messiah. Even in Jesus' youth, they were acquainted with the Holy Family, just as pious, noble people are wont to be with their humble, devout neighbors. The parents of Lazarus had in all fifteen children, of whom six died young. Of the nine that survived, only four were living at the time of Christ's teaching. These four were, Lazarus. Martha, about two years younger. Mary, looked upon as a simpleton, two years younger than Martha. And Mary Magdalene, five years younger than a simpleton. The simpleton is not named in scripture, not reckoned among the Lazarus family. But she is known to God. She was always put aside in her family, and lived altogether unknown. Magdalene, the youngest child, was very beautiful and, even in her early years, tall and well developed like a girl of more advanced age. She was full of frivolity and seductive art. Her parents died when she was only seven years old. She had no great love for them even from her earliest age, on account of their severe fasts. Even as a child, she was vain beyond expression, given to petty thefts, proud, self-willed, and a lover of pleasure. She was never faithful, but clung to whatever flattered her the most. She was, therefore, extravagant in her pity when her sensitive compassion was aroused, and kind and condescending to all that appealed to her senses by some external show. Her mother had had some share in Magdalene's faulty education, and that sympathetic softness the child had inherited from her. Magdalene was spoiled by her mother and her nurse. They showed her off everywhere, caused her cleverness and pretty little ways to be admired, and sat much with her dressed up at the window. That window sitting was the chief cause of her ruin. I saw her at the window and on the terraces of the house upon a magnificent seat of carpets and cushions, where she could be seen in all her splendor from the street. She used to steal sweetmeats, and take them to other children in the garden of the castle. Even in her ninth year she was engaged in love affairs. With her developing talents and beauty, increased also the talk and admiration they excited. She had crowds of companions. She was taught, and she wrote love verses on little rolls of parchment. I saw her while so engaged counting on her fingers. She sent these verses around, and exchanged them with her lovers. Her fame spread on all sides, and she was exceedingly admired. But I never saw that she either really loved or was loved. It was all, on her part at least, vanity, frivolity, self-adoration, and confidence in her own beauty. I saw her a scandal to her brother and sisters whom she despised and of whom she was ashamed on account of their simple life. When the patrimony was divided, the castle of Magdalene fell by lot to Magdalene. It was a very beautiful building. Magdalene had often gone there with her family when she was a very young child, and she had always entertained the special preference for it. She was only about eleven years old when, with a large household of servants, men and maids, she retired thither and set up a splendid establishment for herself. Magdalene was a fortified place, consisting of several castles, public buildings, and large squares of groves and gardens. It was eight hours east of Nazareth, about three from Cathanorm one and a half from Bethsaida toward the south, and about a mile from the lake of Chnisereth. It was built on a slope of the mountain and extended down into the valley which stretches off toward the lake and around its shores. One of those castles belonged to Herod. 
he possessed a still larger one in the fertile region of Chnisereth. Some of his soldiers were stationed in Magdalen, and they contributed their share to the general demoralization. The officers were on intimate terms with Magdalen. There were, besides the troops, about 200 people in Magdalen, chiefly officials, master builders, and servants. There was no synagogue in the place. The people went to the one at Bethsaida. The castle of Magdalen was the highest and most magnificent of all. From its roof one could see across the Sea of Galilee to the opposite shore. Five roads led to Magdalen, and on every one at one half hour's distance from the well-fortified place, stood a tower built over an arch. It was like a watchtower whence could be seen far into the distance. These towers had no connection with one another. They rose out of a country covered with gardens, fields, and meadows. Magdalen had meant servants and maids, fields and herds, but a very disorderly household. All went to rack and ruin. Through the wild ravine at the head of which Magdalen lay far up on the height, flowed a little stream to the lake. Around its banks was a quantity of game, for from the three deserts contiguous to the valley the wild beasts came down to drink. Herod used to hunt here. He had also near his castle in the country of Genesareth a park filled with game. The country of Genesareth began between Tiberias and Tarichia, about four hours' distance from Catharnorm. It extended from the sea three hours inland and to the south around Tarichia to the mouth of the Jordan. The rising valley with the baths near Betalia, artificially formed from a brook nearby, lay contiguous to this region, and was watered by streams flowing to the sea. This brook formed in its course several artificial lakes and waterfalls in different parts of the beautiful district which consisted entirely of gardens, villas, castles, parks, walks, orchards, and vineyards. The whole year round found it teeming with blossoms and fruits. The rich ones of the land, and especially of Jerusalem, had here their villas and gardens. Every portion was under cultivation, or laid off in pleasure grounds, groves, and verdant labyrinths and adorned with walks winding around pyramidal hillocks. There were no large villages in this part of the country. The permanent residents were mostly gardeners and custodians of the property, also shepherds whose herds consisted of fine sheep and goats. There were besides all kinds of rare animals and birds under their care. No street ran through Magdalen, but two roads from the sea and from the Jordan met here. Magdalen's first conversion. On leaving Giscala, Jesus did not go to Betalia which was near, but leaving it on the left, he traversed the valley and the plain to the somewhat important city of Gabra. It lay at the western foot of the mountain on whose southeastern slope was perched the Ridianary Jetubatha. The distance between the city and the fortress, that is, if one went around the mountain, was one hour. This mountain, in which steps were hewn, arose like a steep wall behind Gabra, whose inhabitants were engaged in the manufacture of cotton fine as silk which they wove into cloth and covers. They made of it also a kind of mattress, which they stretched and fastened on hooks. This formed the whole bed. Some others were engaged in salting and exporting fish. While still in Jiscala, Jesus had sent some of the disciples around to the neighboring places to say that he would deliver a great instruction on the mountain beyond Gabra. There came in consequence, from a circuit of several hours, large crowds of people, who encamped around the mountain. On the summit was an enclosed space in which was a teacher's chair long out of use. Peter, Andrew, James, John, Nathan Ale chased, and all the rest of the disciples had come, besides most of John's disciples and the sons of the Blessed Virgin's eldest sister. There were altogether about sixty disciples, friends, and relatives of Jesus here assembled. The more intimate of the disciples were greeted by Jesus with clasping of both hands and pressing cheek to cheek. Crowds of heathens came from Sidessa, one hour westward of the neighboring city of Damna, from Adama and the country around Lake Merome. The people crowding hither brought with them provisions and sick of all kinds. Sidessa was a heathen city in the heart of Zebulon. It was in ruins in the time of Alexander the Great, who bestowed it upon a man from Tyre called Livias. The latter restored it, and led thither many of his pagan countrymen from Tyre. The first pagans that came to John's baptism were from Sidessa, which was very beautifully situated and commanded a view of the luxuriantly fruitful country around. Magdalene. Magdalene also wended her way to the Mount of Instruction near Gabra. Martha and Anna Clippers had left Damna, 
where the holy women had an inn, and gone to Magdalen with the view of persuading Magdalene to attend the sermon that Jesus was about to deliver on the mountain beyond Gebra. Veronica, Johanna Chuzza, Dinner, and the supernight had meanwhile remained at Damna, distant three hours from Cathar Norman over one hour from Magdalene. Magdalene received her sister in a manner rather kind and showed her into an apartment not far from her room of state, but into this latter she did not take her. There was in Magdalene a mixture of true and false shame. She was partly ashamed of her simple, pious, and plainly dressed sister who went around with Jesus' followers so despised by her visitors and associates, and she was partly ashamed of herself before Martha. It was this feeling that prevented her taking the latter into the apartments that were the scenes of her follies and vices. Magdalene was somewhat broken in spirits, but she lacked the courage to disengage herself from her surroundings. She looked pale and languid. The man with whom she lived, on account of his low and vulgar sentiments, was utterly distasteful to her. Martha treated her very prudently and affectionately. She said to her, Dinner and Mary, the supernight, whom you know, two amiable and clever women, invite you to be present with them at the instruction that Jesus is going to give on the mountain. It is so near, and they are so anxious for your company. You need not be ashamed of them before the people, for they are respectable, they dress with taste, and they have distinguished manners. You will behold a very wonderful spectacle, the crowds of people, the marvellous eloquence of the prophet, the sick, the cures that he effects, the hardihood with which he addresses the Pharisees. Veronica, Mary Chuzza, and Jesus' mother, who wishes you so well, we all are convinced that you will thank us for the invitation. I think it will cheer you up a little. You appear to be quite forlorn here, you have no one around you who can appreciate your heart and your talents. Oh, if you would only pass some time with us in Britannia. We hear so many wonderful things, and we have so much good to do, and you have always been so full of compassion and kindness. You must at least come to Damna with me tomorrow morning. There you will find all the women of our party at the inn. You can have a private apartment and meet only those that you know, etc. In this strain Martha spoke to her sister, carefully avoiding anything that night wound her. Magdalene's sadness predisposed her to listen favorably to Martha's proposals. She did indeed raise a few difficulties, but at last yielded and promised Martha to accompany her to Damna. She took her repast with her and went several times during the evening from her own apartments to see her. Martha and Anaclepus prayed together that night that God would render the coming journey fruitful and good for Magdalene. A few days previously James the Greater, impelled by a feeling of intense compassion for Magdalene, had come to invite her to the preaching soon to take place at Gebra. She had received him at a neighboring house. James was in appearance very imposing. His speech was grave and full of wisdom though at the same time most pleasing. He made a most favorable impression upon Magdalene, and she received him graciously whenever he was in that part of the country. James did not address to her words of reproof. On the contrary, his manner toward her was marked by esteem and kindliness, and he invited her to be present at least once at Jesus' preaching. It would be impossible, he said, to see or hear one superior to him. She had no need to trouble herself about the other auditors and she might appear among them in her ordinary dress. Magdalene had received his invitation favorably, but she was still undecided as to whether she should or should I not accept it, when Martha and Anaclepas arrived. On the eve of the day appointed for the instruction, Magdalene with Martha and Anaclepas started from Magdalene to join the holy women at Damna. Magdalene rode on in us, for she was not accustomed to walking. She was dressed elegantly, though not to such excess nor so extravagantly as at a later period when she was converted for the second time. She took a private apartment in the inn and spoke only with dinner and the supernight, who visited her by turns. I saw them together, an affable and well-bred confident marking their intercourse. There was, however, on the part of the converted sinners, a shade of embarrassment similar to what might be experienced on a military officer's meeting a former comrade who had become a priest. This feeling soon gave way to tears and womanly expressions of mutual sympathy, and they went together to the inn at the foot of the mountain. The other holy women did not go to the instruction, in order not to annoy Magdalene by their presence. They had come to Damna with the intention of prevailing upon Jesus to remain there and not go to Capernaum where Pharisees from various localities were again assembled. They, the Pharisees, had taken up their abode together, 
determined to make Capernaum their headquarters for a while, since it was the central point of all Jesus' journeyings. The young Pharisee from Samaria who was present the last time was not among this set. Another had taken his place. At Nazareth also and in other places the Pharisees had formed similar unions against Jesus. The holy women, and especially Mary, were very much troubled, for the Pharisees had uttered loud threats. They sent a messenger to Jesus imploring him not to go to Capernaum after this instruction, but to join them in Damna. Or he might turn to the right or to the left as seemed good to him. Or better perhaps would it be for him to cross the lake and preach among the pagan cities where he would run no risk. Jesus replied by sending them word not to worry about him, that he knew what was best for him to do, and that he would see them again in Capernaum. Magdalene and her companions reached the mountain in good time, and found crowds of people already encamped around it. The sick of all kinds were, according to the nature of their maladies, ranged together in different places under light canopies and arbors. High upon the mountain were the disciples, kindly ranging the people in order and rendering them every assistance. Around the teacher's chair was a low, semicircular wall, and over it an awning. The audience had here and there similar awnings erected. At a short distance from the teacher's chair, Magdalene and the other women had found a comfortable seat upon a little eminence. About ten o'clock, Jesus ascended the mountain with his disciples, followed by the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees, and took the teacher's chair. The disciples were on one side, the Pharisees on the other forming a circle around him. Several times during his discourse, Jesus made a pause to allow his hearers to exchange places, the more distant coming forward, the nearest falling back, and he likewise repeated the same instructions several times. His auditors partook of refreshments in the intervals, and Jesus himself once took a mouthful to eat and a little drink. This discourse of Jesus was one of the most powerful that he had yet delivered. He prayed before he began, and then told his hearers that they should not be scandalized at him if he called God his Father, for whosoever does the will of the Father in heaven, he is his Son, and that he really accomplished the Father's will, he clearly proved. Hereupon he prayed aloud to his Father and then commenced his austere preaching of penance after the manner of the ancient prophets. All that had happened from the time of the first promise, all the figures and all the menaces, he introduced into his discourse and showed how, in the present and in the near future, they would be accomplished. He proved the coming of the Messiah from the fulfillment of the prophecies. He spoke of John, the precursor and preparer of the ways, who had honestly fulfilled his mission, but whose hearers had remained obdurant. Then he enumerated their vices, their hypocrisy, their idolatry of sinful flesh. Painted in strong colors the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Ridians, and spoke with great warmth of the anger of God and the approaching judgment of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, and of the diverse woes that hung over their country. He quoted many passages from the prophet Malachius, explaining and applying them to the precursor, to the Messiah, to the pure oblation of bread and wine of the new law, which I plainly understood to signify the holy sacrifice of the Mass, to the judgment awaiting the godless, to the second coming of the Messiah on the last day, and spoke of the confidence and consolation those that feared God would then experience. He added, Moreover, that the grace taken from them would be given to the heathens. Then turning to the disciples, Jesus exhorted them to confidence and perseverance, and told them that he would send them to preach salvation to all nations. He warned them to hold neither to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, nor the Hridians, whom he painted in lively colors by comparisons as just as they were striking. This was peculiarly vexatious to the last named, since no one wanted to be publicly known as an they who adhered to this sect did so mostly in secret. When in the course of his instruction Jesus observed that if his hearers would not accept the salvation offered them, it would be worse for them than for Sodom and Gomorrah, some of the Pharisees, taking advantage of a pause, stepped up to him with the question, Then, will this mountain, this city, yes, even the whole country, be swallowed up along with us all? And could there happen something still worse? Jesus answered, the stones of Sodom were swallowed up, but not all the souls, for these latter knew not of the promise, nor had they the law and the prophets. He added some words that I understood of his own future descent into limbo, and from which I gathered that many of those souls were saved. Then coming back to the Jews of his own time, he reminded them that they were a chosen race whom God had formed into one nation, 
that they had received instruction and warnings, the promises and their realization, that if they rejected them and persevered in their incredulity, not the rocks, the mountains, for they obeyed the Lord, but their own stony hearts, their own souls, would be hurled into the abyss. And thus would their lot be more grievous than that of Sodom. When Jesus had, thus vehemently urged the guilty to penance, when he had so severely pronounced judgment upon the obdurate, he became once more all love, invited all sinners to come to him, and even shed over them tears of compassion. Then he implored his father to touch their hearts that some, a few, yes, even one, though burdened with all kinds of guilt, might return to him. Could he gain but one soul, he would share all with it, he would give all that he possessed, yes, he would even sacrifice his life to purchase it. He stretched out his arms toward them, exclaiming, Come! Come to me, ye who are weary and laden with guilt! Come to me, ye sinners! Do penance, believe, and share the kingdom with me! Then turning to the Pharisees, to his enemies, he opened his arms to them also, beseeching all, at least one of them, to come to him. Magdalene had taken her seat among the other women with the self-confident air of a lady of the world, but her manner was assumed. She was inwardly confused and a prey to interior struggle. At first she gazed around upon the crowd, but when Jesus appeared and began to speak, her eyes and soul were riveted upon him alone. His exhortations to penance, his lively pictures of vice, his threats of chastisement, affected her powerfully, and unable to suppress her emotions, she trembled and wept beneath her veil. When Jesus, himself shedding tears full of loving compassion, cried out for sinners to come to him, many of his hearers were transported with emotion. There was a movement in the circle and the crowd pressed around him. Magdalene also, and following her example the other women likewise, took a step nearer. But when Jesus exclaimed, Ah! If even one soul would come to me! Magdalene was so moved that she wanted to fly to him at once. She stepped forward. But her companions, fearing some disturbance, held her back whispering, wait, wait. This movement of Magdalene attracted scarcely any notice among the bystanders, since the attention of all was riveted upon Jesus' words. Jesus, aware of Magdalene's agitation, uttered words of consolation meant only for her. He said, if even one germ of penance, of contrition, of love, of faith, of hope has, in consequence of my words, fallen upon some poor, erring heart, it will bear fruit it will be set down in favor of that poor sinner, it will live and increase. I myself shall nourish it, shall cultivate it, shall present it to my father. These words consoled Magdalene while they pierced her inmost soul, and she stepped back again among her companions. It was now about six o'clock, and the sun had already sunk low behind the mountain. During his discourse Jesus was turned to the west, the point toward which the teacher's chair faced, and there was no one behind him. And now he prayed, dismissed the multitude with his blessing, and commanded the disciples to buy food and distribute it to the poor and needy. Whoever had more than enough for himself was to give it or sell it for the benefit of the poor, who were to take home with them whatever they received over and above. Some of the disciples went immediately to execute their master's commission. Most of those present gave willingly what they could spare, while others just as willingly took some indemnification for it. The disciples were well known in this part of the country, so the poor were well cared for, and they thanked the great charity of the Lord. Meanwhile the other disciples accompanied Jesus to the sick, numbers of whom had been brought thither. The Pharisees, scandalized, impressed, astonished, enraged, went back to Gabra. Simon Zebulon, the chief of the synagogue, reminded Jesus of the invitation to sup in his house. Jesus replied that he would be there. The Pharisees murmured against Jesus and criticized him the whole way down the mountain, finding fault with his doctrine and his manners. Each was ashamed to allow his neighbor to remark the favorable impression that had been made upon him, and so by the time they reached the city, they had again entrenched themselves in their own self-righteousness. Magdalene and her companions followed Jesus. The former went among the people and took her place near the sick women as if to render them assistance. She was very much impressed and the misery that she witnessed moved her still more. Jesus turned first to the men, among whom for a long time he healed diseases of all kinds. The hymns of thanksgiving from the cured and their attendants as they moved away, rang on the breeze. 
when he approached the sick females, the crowd that pressed around him and the need that he and his disciples had of space forced Magdalene and the holy women to fall back a little. Nevertheless, Magdalene sought by every opportunity, by every break in the crowd, to draw near to him, but Jesus constantly turned away from her. He healed some women afflicted with the flow of blood. But how express the feelings of Magdalene, so delicate, so effeminate, whose eyes were quite unused to the sight of human suffering. What memories, what gratitude swelled the heart of Mary Supain when six women, bound three and three, were forcibly led to Jesus by strong servant maids who dragged them along with cords, or long linen bands. They were possessed in the most frightful manner by unclean spirits, and they were the first possessed women that I saw brought publicly to Jesus. Some were from beyond the lake of Chnisereth, some from Samaria, and among them were several pagans. They had been bound together only upon reaching this place. Ordinarily they were perfectly quiet and gentle, they offered no violence to one another. But anon, they became quite furious, screaming and hurling themselves here and there. Their custodians bound them and kept them at a distance during Jesus' discourse, and now when all was nearly over, they brought them forward. As the afflicted creatures drew near to Jesus and the disciples, they began to offer vehement resistance. Satan was tormenting them horribly. They uttered the most awful cries and fell into violent contortions. Jesus turned toward them and commanded them to be silent, to be at peace. They instantly stood still and motionless. Then he went up to them, ordered them to be unbound, commanded them to kneel down, prayed, and laid his hands upon them. Under the touch of his hand they sank into a few moments' unconsciousness, during which the wicked spirits went out of them in the form of a dark vapor. Then their attendants lifted them up, and veiled them in tears, they stood before Jesus, inclining low and giving thanks. He warned them to amend their lives, to purify themselves and do penance, lest their misfortune might come upon them more frightfully than before. It was dusk before Jesus and the disciples, preceded and followed by crowds of people, started at last down the mountain for Gabra. Magdalene, obeying only her impulse without regard to appearances, followed close after Jesus in the crowd of disciples, and her four companions, unwilling to separate from her, did the same. She tried to keep as close to Jesus as she possibly could, though such conduct was quite unusual in females. Some of the disciples called Jesus' attention to the fact, remarking at the same time what I have just observed. But Jesus, turning around to them, replied, Let them alone. It is not your affair. And so he entered the city. When he reached the hall in which Simon Zebulon had prepared the feast, he found the forecourt filled with the sick and the poor who had crowded thither on his approach, and who were loudly calling upon him for help. Jesus at once turned to them, exhorting, consoling, and healing them. Meanwhile Simon Zebulon, with some other Pharisees, made his appearance. He begged Jesus to come into the feast, for they were awaiting him. Thou hast, he continued, already done enough for today. Let these people wait till another time, and let the poor go off at once. But Jesus replied, These are my guests. I have invited them, and I must first see to their entertainment. When thou didst invite me to thy feast, thou didst invite them also. I shall not go into thy feast until they are helped, and then even I will go in only with them. Then the Pharisees had to go and prepare tables around the court for the cured and the poor. Jesus cured all, and the disciples led those that wished to remain to the tables prepared for them, and lamps were lighted in the court. Magdalene and the women had followed Jesus hither. They stood in one of the halls of the court adjoining the entertainment hall. Jesus, followed by some of the disciples, went to the table in the latter and from its sumptuous dishes sent various meats to the tables of the poor. The disciples were the bearers of these gifts. They likewise served and ate with the poor. Jesus continued his instructions during the entertainment. The Pharisees were in animated discussion with him when Magdalene, who with her companions had approached the entrance, all on a sudden darted into the hall. Inclining humbly, her head veiled, in her hand a little white flask closed with a tiny bunch of aromatic herbs instead of a stopper, she glided quickly into the center of the apartment, went behind Jesus, and poured the contents of her little flask over his head. Then catching up the long end of her veil, she folded it, and with both hands passed it lightly once over Jesus' head, as if wishing to smooth his hair and to arrest the overflow of the ointment. The whole affair occupied but a few instants, 
and after it Magdalene retired some steps. The discussion carried on so hotly at the moment suddenly ceased. A hush fell upon the company, and they gazed upon Jesus and the woman. The air was redolent with the fragrance of the ointment. Jesus was silent. Some of the guests put their heads together, glanced indignantly at Magdalene, and exchanged whispers. Simon Zebulon especially appeared scandalized. At last Jesus said to him, Simon, I know well of what thou art thinking. Thou thinkest it improper that I should allow this woman to anoint my head. Thou art thinking that she is a sinner, but thou art wrong. She, out of love, has fulfilled what thou didst leave and done. Thou hast not shown me the honor due to guests. Then he turned to Magdalene, who was still standing there, and said, Go in peace. Much has been forgiven thee. At these words Magdalene rejoined her companions, and they left the house together. Then Jesus spoke of her to the guests. He called her a good woman full of compassion. He censured the criticizing of others, public accusations, and remarks upon the exterior fault of others while the speakers often hid in their own hearts much greater, though secret evils. Jesus continued speaking and teaching for a considerable time, and then returned with his followers to the inn. Magdalene was deeply touched and impressed by all she had seen and heard. She was interiorly vanquished. And because she was possessed of a certain impetuous spirit of self-sacrifice, a certain greatness of soul, she longed to do something to honor Jesus and to testify to him her emotion. She had noticed with chagrin that neither before nor during the meal had he, the most wonderful, the holiest of teachers, he, the most compassionate, the most miraculous helper of mankind, received from these Pharisees any mark of honor, any of those polite attentions usually extended to guests, and therefore she felt herself impelled to do what she had done. The words of Jesus, if even one would be moved to come to me, still lingered in her memory. The little flask, which was about a hand in height, she generally carried with her as do the grand ladies of our own day. Magdalene's dress was white, embroidered with large red flowers and tiny green leaves. The sleeves were wide, gathered in and fastened by bracelets. The robe was cut wide and hung loose in the back. It was open in front to just above the knee, where it was caught by straps, or cords. The bodice, both back and front, was ornamented with cords and jewels. It passed over the shoulders like a scapula and was fastened at the sides. Under it was another colored tunic. The veil that she usually wound about her neck she had, on entering the banquet hall, opened wide and thrown over her whole person. Magdalene was taller than all the other women, robust, but yet graceful. She had very beautiful, tapering fingers, a small, delicate foot, a wealth of beautiful long hair, and there was something imposing in all her movements. When Magdalene returned to the inn with her companions, Martha took her to another about an hour distant and near the baths of Betalia. There she found Mary and the holy women awaiting her coming, Mary conversed with her. Magdalene gave an account of Jesus' discourse, while the two other women related the circumstances of Magdalene's anointing and Jesus' words to her. All insisted on Magdalene's remaining and going back with them, at least for a while, to Britannia. But she replied that she must return to Magdalene to make some arrangements in her household, a resolution very distasteful to her pious friends. She could not however, cease talking of the impressions she had received and of the majesty, force, sweetness, and miracles of Jesus. She felt that she must follow him, that her own life was an unworthy one, and that she ought to join her sister and friends. She became very thoughtful, she wept from time to time, and her heart grew lighter. Nevertheless, she could not be induced to remain, so she returned to Magdalene with her maid. Martha accompanied her a part of the way and then joined the holy women who were going back to Kafarnaum. Magdalene was taller and more beautiful than the other women. Dinner, however, was much more active and dexterous, very cheerful, ever ready to oblige, like a lively, affectionate girl, and she was moreover very humble. But the Blessed Virgin surpassed them all in her marvelous beauty. Although in external loveliness she may have had her equal, and may have even been excelled by Magdalene in certain striking features, Yet she far outshone them all in her indescribable air of simplicity, modesty, earnestness, sweetness, and gentleness. She was so very pure, so free from all earthly impressions that in her one saw only the reflex image of God in his creature. No one's bearing resembled hers, except that of her son. 
Her countenance surpassed that of all women in its unspeakable purity, innocence, gravity, wisdom, peace, and sweet, devout loveliness. Her whole appearance was noble, and yet she was like a simple, innocent child. She was very grave, very quiet, and often pensive, but never did her sadness destroy the beauty of her countenance, for her tears flowed softly down her placid face. Magdalene was soon again in her old track. She received the visits of men who spoke in the usual disparaging way of Jesus, his journeys, his doctrine, and of all who followed him. They ridiculed what they heard of Magdalene's visit to Gabra, and looked upon it as a very unlikely story. As for the rest, they declared that they found Magdalene more beautiful and charming than ever. It was by such speeches that Magdalene allowed herself to be infatuated and her good impressions dissipated. She soon sank deeper than before, and her relapse into sin gave the devil greater power over her. He attacked her more vigorously when he saw that he might possibly lose her. She became possessed, and often fell into cramps and convulsions. Second Conversion of Magdalene About an hour to the south of the inn at Dutain lay the little town of Azanuth. It was built on an eminence upon which was a teacher's chair and, in earlier times, it had often been the scene of the prophet's preaching. Through the activity of the disciples, the report had been spread throughout the whole region that Jesus was about to deliver a great instruction in that place, and in consequence of this report, multitudes were gathered there from all Galilee. Martha, attended by her maid, had journeyed to Magdalene in the hope of inducing her to be present at the instruction, but she was received very haughtily by her sister, with whom things had come to the worst. She was, on Martha's arrival, engaged at her toilet, and sent word that she could not speak to her then. Martha awaited her sister's appearance with unspeakable patience, occupying herself meanwhile in prayer. At last the unhappy Magdalene presented herself, her manner haughty, excited, and defiant. She was ashamed of Martha's simple attire. She feared that some of her guests might see her, consequently she requested her to go away as soon as possible. But Martha begging to be allowed to rest in some corner of the house, she and her maid were conducted to a room in one of the side buildings where, either through design or forgetfulness, they were allowed to remain without food or drink. It was then afternoon. Meanwhile Magdalene adorned herself for the banquet, at which she was seated on the richly decorated chair, while Martha and her maid were in prayer. After the reverie, Magdalene went at last to Martha, taking with her something on a little blue-edged plate and something to drink. She addressed Martha angrily and disdainfully, her whole demeanor expressive of pride, insolence, uneasiness, and interior agitation. Martha, full of humility and affection, invited Magdalene to go with her once more to the great instruction Jesus was going to deliver in the neighborhood. All Magdalene's female friends, Martha urged, those whom she had lately met, would be there and very glad to see her. She herself, Magdalene, had already testified to the esteem in which she held Jesus, and she should now gratify Lazarus and herself, Martha, by going once more to hear him preach. She would not soon again have the opportunity of hearing the wonderful prophet and at the same time of seeing all her friends in her own neighborhood. She had shown by her anointing of Jesus at the banquet at Gabra that she knew how to honor greatness and majesty. She should now again salute him whom she had once so nobly and fearlessly honored in public, etc., etc. It would be impossible to say how lovingly Martha spoke to her erring sister or how patiently she endured her shamefully contemptuous manner. At last Magdalene replied, I shall go, but not with you. You can go on ahead, for I will not be seen with one so miserably clothed. I shall dress according to my position, and I shall go with my own friends. At these words, the two sisters separated, for it was very late. Next morning Magdalene sent for Martha to come to her room while she was making her toilet. Martha went patient as usual and secretly praying that Magdalene might go with her and be converted. Magdalene, clothed in the fine woolen garment, was sitting on a low stool, while two of her maids were busily engaged washing her feet and arms and perfuming them with fragrant water. Her hair was divided into three parts above the ears and at the back of the head, after which it was combed, brushed, oiled, and braided. Over her fine woolen undergarment was put a green robe embroidered with large yellow flowers, and over that again a mantle with folds. Her headdress was a kind of crimped cap that rose high on the forehead. Both her hair and her cap were interwoven with numberless pearls, and in her ears were long pendants. Her sleeves were wide above the elbow, 
but narrow below and fastened with broad, glittering bracelets. Her robe was plaited. Her underbodice was open on the breast and laced with shining cords. During the toilet, Magdalena held in her hand a round, polished mirror. She wore an ornament on her breast. It was covered with gold, and encrusted with cut stones and pearls. Over the narrow sleeved underdress she wore an upper one with a long flowing train and short, wide sleeves. It was made of changeable violet silk, and embroidered with large flowers, some in gold, others in different colors. The braids of her hair were ornamented with roses made of raw silk, and strings of pearls, interwoven with some kind of stiff transparent stuff that stood out in points. Very little of the hair could be seen through its load of ornamentation. It was rolled high around the face. Over this headdress, Magdalene wore a rich hood of fine, transparent material. It fell on the high headdress in front, shaded the cheeks, and hung low on the shoulders behind. Martha took leave of her sister, and went to the inn near Damna, in order to tell Mary and the holy women the success she had had in their efforts to persuade Magdalene to be present at the instruction about to be given in Azanath. With the Blessed Virgin about a dozen women had come to Damna, among them Emma Kleppers, Susanna Alpheus, Susanna of Jerusalem, Veronica, Johanna Chuzza, Mary Marcus, Dinner, Moroni, and the Super Knight. Jesus, accompanied by six apostles and a number of the disciples, started from the inn at Dutain for Azanath. On the way, he met the holy women coming from Damna. Lazarus was among Jesus' companions on this occasion. After Martha's departure, Magdalene was very much tormented by the devil, who wanted to prevent her going to Jesus' instruction. She would have followed his suggestions, were it not for some of her guests who had agreed to go with her to Azanath, to witness what they called a great show. Magdalene and her frivolous, sinful companions rode on asses to the inn of the holy women near the baths of Betalia. Magdalene's splendid seat, along with cushions and rugs for the others, followed packed on asses. Next morning Magdalene, again arrayed in her most wanton attire and surrounded by her companions, made her appearance at the place of instruction, which was about an hour from the inn at which she was stopping. With noise and bustle, loud talk and bold staring about, they took their places under an open tent far in front of the holy women. There were some men of their own stamp in their party. They sat upon cushions and rugs and upholstered chairs, all in full view, Magdalene in front. Their coming gave rise to general whispering and murmurs of disapprobation, for they were even more detested and despised in these quarters than in Gabra. The Pharisees especially, who knew of her first remarkable conversion at Gabla and of her subsequent relapse into her former disorders, were scandalized and expressed their indignation at her daring to appear in such an assembly. Jesus, after healing many sick, began his long and severe discourse. The details of his sermon, I cannot now recall, but I know that he cried woe upon Catharnorm, Bethsaida, and Chorazin. He said also that the Queen of Saba had come from the south to hear the wisdom of Solomon, but here was one greater than Solomon. And the wonder. Children that had never yet spoken, babes in their mother's arms, cried out from time to time during the instruction, Jesus of Nazareth. Holiest of prophets. Son of David. Son of God. Which words caused many of the hearers, and among them Magdalene, to tremble with fear. Making allusion to Magdalene. Jesus said that when the devil has been driven out and the house has been swept, he returns with six other demons, and rages worse than before. These words terrified Magdalene. After Jesus had in this way touched the hearts of many, he turned successively to all sides and commanded the demon to go out of all that side for deliverance from his thraldom, but that those who wished to remain bound to the devil should depart and take him along with them. At this command, the possessed cried out from all parts of the circle, Jesus, the Son of God. And here and there people sank to the ground unconscious. Magdalene also, from her splendid seat upon which she had attracted all eyes, fell in violent convulsions. Her companions in sin applied perfumes as restoratives, and wanted to carry her away. Desiring to remain under the empire of the evil one, they were themselves glad to profit by the opportunity to retire from the scene. But just then some persons near her cried out, Stop, Master! Stop! This woman is dying. Jesus interrupted his discourse to reply, place her on her chair. The death she is now dying is a good death, and one that will vivify her. After some time another word of Jesus pierced her to the heart, 
and she again fell into convulsions, during which dark forms escaped from her. A crowd gathered round her in alarm, while her own immediate party tried once again to bring her to herself. She was soon able to resume her seat on her beautiful chair, and then she tried to look as if she had suffered only an ordinary fainting spell. She had now become the object of general attention, especially as many other possessed back in the crowd had, like her, fallen in convulsions, and afterward rose up freed from the evil one. But when for the third time Magdalene fell down in violent convulsions, the excitement increased, and Martha hurried forward to her. When she recovered consciousness, she acted like one bereft of her senses. She wept passionately, and wanted to go to where the holy women were sitting. The frivolous companions with whom she had come hither held her back forcibly, declaring that she should not play the fool, and they at last succeeded in getting her down the mountain. Lazarus, Martha, and others who had followed her, now went forward and led her to the inn of the holy women. The crowd of worldlings who had accompanied Magdalene had already made their way off. Before going down to his inn, Jesus healed many blind and sick. Later on, he taught again in the school, and Magdalene was present. She was not yet quite cured, but profoundly impressed, and no longer so wantonly arrayed. She had laid aside her superfluous finery, some of which was made of a fine scalloped material like pointed lace, and so perishable that it could be worn only once. She was now veiled. Jesus in his instruction appeared again to speak for her special benefit and, when he fixed upon her his penetrating glance, she fell once more into unconsciousness and another evil spirit went out of her. Her maids bore her from the synagogue to where she was received by Martha and Mary, who took her back to the inn. She was now like one distracted. She cried and wept. She ran through the public streets saying to all she met that she was a wicked creature, a sinner, the refuse of humanity. The holy women had the greatest trouble to quiet her. She tore her garments, disarranged her hair, and hid her face in the folds of her veil. When Jesus returned to his inn with the disciples and some of the Pharisees, and while they were taking some refreshments standing, Magdalene escaped from the holy women, ran with streaming hair and uttering loud lamentations, made her way through the crowd, cast herself at Jesus' feet, weeping and moaning, and asked if she might still hope for salvation. The Pharisees and disciples, scandalized at the sight, said to Jesus that he should no longer suffer this reprobate woman to create disturbance everywhere, that he should send her away once for all. But Jesus replied, Permit her to weep and lament. Ye know not what is passing in her. And he turned to her with words of consolation. He told her to repent from her heart, to believe and to hope, for that she should soon find peace. Then he bade her depart with confidence. Martha, who had followed with her maids, took her again to her inn. Magdalene did nothing but wring her hands and lament. She was not yet quite freed from the power of the evil one, who tortured and tormented her with the most frightful remorse and despair. There was no rest for her she thought herself forever lost. Upon her request, Lazarus went to Magdalene in order to take charge of her property, and to dissolve the ties she had there formed. She owned near as enough and in the surrounding country fields and vineyards which Lazarus, on account of her extravagance, had previously sequestered. To escape the great crowd that had gathered here, Jesus went that night with his disciples into the neighborhood of Damna, where there was an inn, as well as a lovely eminence upon which stood a chair for teaching. Next morning when the holy women came thither accompanied by Magdalene, they found Jesus already encompassed by people seeking his aid. When his departure became known, the crowds awaiting him at Azanath, as well as new visitors, came streaming to Damna, and fresh bands continued to arrive during the whole instruction. Magdalene, crushed and miserable, now sat among the holy women. Jesus inveighed severely against the sin of impurity, and said that it was the device that had called down fire upon Sodom and Gomorrah. But he spoke of the mercy of God also under the present time of pardon, almost conjuring his hearers to accept the grace offered them. Thrice during this discourse did Jesus rest his glance upon Magdalene, and each time I saw her sinking down and dark vapors issuing from her. The third time, the holy women carried her away. She was pale, weak, annihilated as it were, and scarcely recognizable. Her tears flowed incessantly. She was completely transformed, and passionately sighed to confess her sins to Jesus and receive pardon. The instruction over, Jesus went to a retired place, whither Mary herself and Martha led Magdalene to him. 
She fell on her face weeping at his feet, her hair flowing loosely around her. Jesus comforted her. When Mary and Martha had withdrawn, she cried for pardon, confessed her numerous transgressions, and asked over and over, Lord, is there still salvation for me? Jesus forgave her sins, and she implored him to save her from another elapse. He promised so to do, gave her his blessing, and spoke to her of the virtue of purity, also of his mother, who was pure without stain. He praised Mary highly in terms I had never before heard from his lips, and commanded Magdalene to unite herself closely to her and to seek from her advice and consolation. When Jesus and Magdalene rejoined the holy women, Jesus said to them, She has been a great sinner, but for all future time, she will be the model of penitence. Magdalene, through her passionate emotion, her grief and her tears, was no longer like a human being, but like a shadow tottering from weakness. She was, however, calm, though still weeping silent tears that exhausted her. The holy women comforted her with many marks of affection, while she in turn craved pardon of each. As they had to set out for name and Magdalene was too weak to accompany them, Martha, Anna Clippers, and Mary the Supernight went with her to Damna, in order to rest that night and follow the others next morning. The holy women went through Cana to name. Jesus and the disciples went across through the valley of the Baths of Betalia, four or five hours farther on, to Gathepa, a large city that lay on a height between Cana and Sepphoris. They passed the night outside the city at an inn that was near a cave called John's Cave. Magdalene's last anointing of Jesus. Next morning Jesus instructed a large number of the disciples, more than sixty, in the court before Lazarus' house. In the afternoon, about three o'clock, tables were laid for them in the court, and during their meal Jesus and the apostles served. I saw Jesus going from table to table handing something to this one, something to that, and teaching all the time, Judas was not present. He was away making purchases for the entertainment to be given at Simon's. Magdalene also had gone to Jerusalem, to buy precious ointment. The Blessed Virgin, to whom Jesus had that morning announced his approaching death, was inexpressibly sad. Her niece, Mary Clippers, was always around her, consoling her. Full of grief, they went together to the disciples in. Meantime, Jesus conversed with the disciples upon his approaching death and the events that would follow it. One, he said, that had been on intimate terms with him, one that owed him a great debt of gratitude, was about to sell him to the Pharisees. He would not even set a price upon him, but would merely ask, What would ye give me for him? If the Pharisees were buying a slave, it would be at a fixed price, but he would be sold for whatever they chose to give. The traitor would sell him for less than the cost of a slave. The disciples wept bitterly, and became so afflicted that they had to cease eating, but Jesus pressed them graciously. I have often noticed that the disciples were much more affectionate toward Jesus than were the apostles. I think as they were not so much with him, they were on that account more humble. This morning Jesus spoke of many things with his apostles. As they did not understand everything, he commanded them to write down what they could not comprehend, saying that when he would send his spirit to them, they would recall those points and be able to seize their meaning. I saw John and some of the others taking notes, Jesus dwelt long upon their flight, when he himself would be delivered up to the Pharisees. They could not think that such a thing would ever happen to them, and yet they really did take to flight. He predicted many things that were to follow that event, and told them how they should conduct themselves. At last he spoke of his holy mother. He said that through compassion, she would suffer with him all the cruel torture of his death, that with him she would die his bitter death, and still would have to survive him fifteen years. Jesus indicated to the disciples whither they should betake themselves, some to Arimathea, some to Sichar, and others to Kudah. The three that had accompanied him on his last journey were not to return home. Since their ideas and sentiments had undergone so great a change, it would not be well for them to return to their country, otherwise they might give scandal or, on account of the opposition of friends, run the risk of falling back into their former way of acting. Elod and Eremanzir went, I think, to Sichar, but Silas remained where he was. And thus Jesus went on instructing his followers with extraordinary love counseling them on everything. I saw many of them dispersing toward evening. It was during this instruction that Magdalene came back from Jerusalem with the ointment she had brought. She had gone to Veronica's and stayed there while Veronica saw to the purchase of the ointment, which was of three kinds, 
the most precious that could be procured. Magdalene had expended upon it all the money she had left. One was a flask of the oil of spikenard. She bought the flasks together with their contents. The former were of a clear, whitish, though not transparent material, almost like mother of pearl, though not mother of pearl. They were in shape like little urns, the swelling base ornamented with knobs, and they had screw tops. Magdalene carried the vessels under her mantle in a pocket, which hung on her breast suspended by a cord that passed over one shoulder and back across the back. John Mark's mother went back with her to Britannia, and Veronica accompanied them a part of the way. As they were going through Britannia, they met Judas who, concealing his indignation, spoke to Magdalene. Magdalene had heard from Veronica that the Pharisees had resolved to arrest Jesus and put him to death, but not yet, on account of the crowds of strangers and especially the numerous pagans that followed him. This news Magdalene imparted to the other women. The women were at Simon's helping to prepare for the entertainment, for which Judas had purchased everything necessary. He had entirely emptied the purse today, secretly thinking that he would get all back again in the evening. From a man who kept a garden in Britannia, he bought vegetables, two lambs, fruit, fish, honey, etc. The dining hall used at Simon's today was different from that in which Jesus and his friends had dined once before, that is, on the day after the triumphal entrance into the temple. Today they dined in an open hall at the back of the house, and which looked out upon the courtyard. It had been ornamented for the occasion. In the ceiling was an opening which was covered with a transparent veil and which looked like a little cupola. On either side of this cupola hung verdant pyramids of a brownish-green, succulent plant with small round leaves. The pyramids were green likewise at the base, and it seemed to me that they always remained green and fresh. Under this ceiling ornamentation stood the seat for Jesus. One side of the table, that toward the open colonnade through which the viands were brought across the courtyard, was left free. Simon, who served, alone had his place on that side. There too on the floor, under the table, stood three water jugs, tall and flat. The guests reclined during this repast on low cross benches, which in the back had a support, and in front an arm upon which to lean. The benches stood in pairs, and they were sufficiently wide to admit of the guests sitting two and two, facing each other. Jesus reclined at the middle of the table upon a seat to himself. On this occasion the women ate in an open hall to the left. Looking obliquely across the courtyard, they could see the men's at table. When all was prepared, Simon and his servant, in festal robes, went to conduct Jesus, the apostles, and Lazarus. Simon wore a long robe, a girdle embroidered in figures, and on his arm a long fur-lined nipple. The servant wore a sleeveless jacket. Simon escorted Jesus, the servant, the apostles. They did not traverse a street to Simon's, but went in their festal robes back through the garden into the hall. There were numbers of people in Britannia, and the crowds of strangers who had come through a desire to see Lazarus raised somewhat of a tumult. It was also a cause of surprise and dissatisfaction to the people that Simon, whose house formerly stood open, had purchased so large a supply of provisions and closed his establishment. They became in a short time angry and inquisitive and almost scaled the walls during the meal. I do not remember having seen any foot washing going on, but only some little purification before entering the hall. Several large drinking glasses stood on the table, and beside each, two smaller ones. There were three kinds of beverages, one greenish, another red, and the third yellow. I think it was some kind of pear juice. The lamb was served first. It lay stretched out on an oval dish, the head resting on the forefeet. The dish was placed with the head toward Jesus. Jesus took a white knife, like bone or stone, inserted it into the back of the lamb, and cut, first to one side of the neck and then to the other. After that he drew the knife down, making a cut from the head along the whole back. The lines of this cut at once reminded me of the cross. He then laid the slices thus detached before John, Peter and himself, and directed Simon, the host, to carve the lamb down the sides and lay the pieces right and left before the apostles and Lazarus as they sat in order. The holy women were seated around their own table. Magdalene, who was in tears all the time, sat opposite the blessed virgin. There were seven or nine present. They too had a little lamb. It was smaller than that of the other table and lay stretched out flat in the dish, the head toward the mother of God. She it was who carved it. 
The lamb was followed by three large fish and several small ones. The large ones lay in the dish as if swimming in a stiff, white sauce. Then came pastry, little rolls in the shape of lambs, birds with outstretched wings, honeycombs, green herbs like lettuce, and a sauce in which the last named was steeped. I think it was oil. This course was followed by another of fruit that looked like pears. In the center of the dish was something like a gourd upon which other fruit, like grapes, were stuck by their stems. The dishes used throughout the meal were partly white, the inside partly yellow, and they were deep or shallow according to their contents. Jesus taught during the whole meal. It was nearing the close of his discourse. The apostles were stretched forward in breathless attention. Simon, whose services were no longer needed, sat motionless, listening to every word, when Magdalene rose quietly from her seat among the holy women. She had around her a thin, bluish-white mantle, something like the material worn by the three holy kings, and her flowing hair was covered with a veil. Laying the ointment in a fold of her mantle, she passed through the walk that was planted with shrubbery, entered the hall, went up behind Jesus, and cast herself down at his feet, weeping bitterly. She bent her face low over the foot that was resting on the couch, while Jesus himself raised to her the other that was hanging a little toward the floor. Magdalene loosened the sandals and anointed Jesus' feet on the soles and upon the upper part. Then with both hands drawing her flowing hair from beneath her veil, she wiped the Lord's anointed feet, and replaced the sandals. Magdalene's action caused some interruption in Jesus' discourse. He had observed her approach, but the others were taken by surprise. Jesus said, Be not scandalized at this woman, and then addressed some words softly to her. She now arose, stepped behind him and poured over his head some costly water, and that so plentifully that it ran down upon his garments. Then with her hand she spread some of the ointment from the crown down the hind part of his head. The hall was filled with a delicious odor. The apostles whispered together and muttered their displeasure. Even Peter was vexed at the interruption. Magdalene, weeping and veiled, withdrew around behind the table. When she was about to pass before Judas, he stretched forth his hand to stay her while he indignantly addressed to her some words on her extravagance, saying that the purchase money might have been given to the poor. Magdalene made no reply. She was weeping bitterly. Then Jesus spoke, bidding them let her pass, and saying that she had anointed him for his death, for later she would not be able to do it, and that wherever this gospel would be preached. Her action and their murmuring would also be recounted. Magdalene retired, her heart full of sorrow. The rest of the meal was disturbed by the displeasure of the apostles in the reproaches of Jesus. When it was over, all returned to Lazarus. Judas, full of wrath and avarice, thought within himself that he could no longer put up with such things. But concealing his feelings, he laid aside his festal garment and pretended that he had to go back to the public house to see that what remained of the meal was given to the poor. Instead of doing that, however, he ran full speed to Jerusalem. I saw the devil with him all the time, red, thin-bodied, and angular. He was before him and behind him, as if lighting the way for him, Judas saw through the darkness. He stumbled not, but ran along in perfect safety. I saw him in Jerusalem running into the house in which, later on, Jesus was exposed to scorn and derision. The Pharisees and high priests were still together, but Judas did not enter their assembly. Two of them went out and spoke with him below in the courtyard. When he told them that he was ready to deliver Jesus and asked what they would give for him, they showed great joy, and returned to announce it to the rest of the council. After a while, one came out again and made an offer of thirty pieces of silver. Judas wanted to receive them at once, but they would not give them to him. They said that he had once before been there, and then had absented himself for so long, that he should do his duty, and then they would pay him. I saw them offering hands as a pledge of the contract, and on both sides tearing something from their clothing. The Pharisees wanted Judas to stay a while and tell them when and how the bargain would be completed. But he insisted upon going, that suspicion might not be excited. He said that he had yet to find things out more precisely that next day he could act without attracting attention. I saw the devil the whole time between Judas and the Pharisees. On leaving Jerusalem, Judas ran back again to Britannia, where he changed his garments and joined the other apostles. Jesus remained at Lazarus, while his followers withdrew to their own inn. That night Nicodemus came from Jerusalem, 
and on his return Lazarus accompanied him a part of the way. The holy women and the resurrection of the Lord. When the morning sky began to clear with a streak of white light, I saw Magdalene, Mary Clippers, Johanna Chuzna, and Salom, enveloped in mantles, leaving their abode near the Coenaculum. They carried the spices packed in linen cloths, and one of them had a lighted lantern. They kept all hidden under their mantles. The spices consisted of fresh flowers for strewing over the sacred body, and also of expressed sap, essences, and oils for pouring over it. The holy women walked anxiously to the little gate belonging to Nicodemus. The blessed soul of Jesus in dazzling splendor, between two warrior angels and surrounded by a multitude of resplendent figures, came floating down through the rocky roof of the tomb upon the sacred body. It seemed to incline over it and melt, as it were, into one with it. I saw the sacred limbs moving beneath the swathing bands, and the dazzling, living body of the Lord with his soul and his divinity coming forth from the side of the winding sheet as if from the wounded side. The sight reminded me of Eve coming forth from Adam's side. The whole place was resplendent with light and glory. And now I had another vision. I saw the apparition of a dragon with a human head coiling itself up out of the abyss, as if right under the tomb upon which the Lord had been lying. It lashed its serpent-like tail, and turned its head angrily toward the Lord. The risen Redeemer held in his hand a delicate white staff, on whose top floated a little standard. He placed one foot upon the dragon's head, and struck three blows of the staff upon its tail. At each stroke, the monster seemed to contract, and at last sank into the earth, first the body, then the head, the human face still turned upward. I saw a similar serpent lurking around at the moment of Christ's conception. It reminded me of the serpent in paradise and, I think, this vision bore reference to the promise, the seed of the woman shall crush the serpent's head. The whole vision appeared to me symbolical of victory over death, for while I was watching the crushing of the serpent's head, the tomb of the Lord vanished from my sight. Now I saw the Lord floating in glory up through the rock. The earth trembled and an angel in warrior garb shot like lightning from heaven down to the tomb, rolled the stone to one side, and seated himself upon it. The trembling of the earth was so great that the lanterns swung from side to side, and the flames flashed around. The guards fell stunned to the ground and lay there stiff and contorted, as if dead. Cassius saw indeed the glory that environed the holy sepulchre, the rolling away of the stone by the angel, and his seating himself upon it but he did not see the risen Saviour himself. He recovered himself quickly, stepped to the stone couch, felt among the empty linens, and left the sepulchre, outside of which, full of eager desire, he tarried a while to become the witness of a new and wonderful apparition. At the instant the angel shot down to the tomb and the earth quaked, I saw the risen Lord appearing to his blessed mother on Mount Calvary. He was transcendently beautiful and glorious, his manner full of earnestness. His garment, which was like a white mantle thrown about his limbs, floated in the breeze behind him as he walked. It glistened blue and white, like smoke curling in the sunshine. His wounds were very large and sparkling. In those of his hands, one could easily insert a finger. The lips of the wounds formed the sides of an equilateral triangle which met, as it were, in the center of a circle, and from the palm of the hand shot rays of light toward the fingers. The souls of the early patriarchs bowed low before the Blessed Mother, to whom Jesus said something about seeing her again. He showed her his wounds, and when she fell on her knees to kiss his feet, he grasped her hand, raised her up, and disappeared. The holy women, when the Lord arose from the dead, were near the little gate belonging to Nicodemus. They knew nothing of the prodigies that were taking place. They did not know even of the guard at the sepulchre, for they had remained shut up in their house the whole of the preceding day the Sabbath. They anxiously inquired of one another, who will roll away for us a stone from the doors? Full of longing desire to show the last honors to the sacred body in the tomb, they had entirely lost sight of the stone. They wanted to pour nard water and precious balm over the sacred body and scatter their flowers and aromatic shrubs upon it. For to the spices of yesterday's embalming, which Nicodemus alone had procured, they had contributed nothing. They wished therefore to offer now to the body of their Lord and Master the most precious that could be obtained. Salom had shared with Magdalene in defraying most of the cost. She was not the mother of John, but another Salom, a rich lady of Jerusalem, a relative of Saint Joseph. 
At last the holy women concluded to set the spices on the stone before the tomb and to wait till some disciple would come who would open it for them. And so they went on toward the garden. Outside the tomb the stone was rolled to the right, so that the doors, which were merely lying to could now be easily opened. The linums in which the sacred body had been enveloped were on the tomb in the following order. The large winding sheet in which it had been wrapped lay undisturbed, only empty and fallen together, containing nothing but the aromatic herbs. The long bandage that had been wound around it was still lying twisted and at full length just as it had been drawn off, on the outer edge of the tomb. But the linen scarf with which Mary had enveloped Jesus' head lay to the right at the head of the tomb. It looked as if the head of Jesus was still in it, excepting that the covering for the face was raised. When, as they approached, the holy women noticed the lanterns of the guard and the soldiers lying around, they became frightened, and went a short distance past the garden toward Golgotha. Magdalene, however, forgetful of danger, hurried into the garden. Salom followed her at some distance, and the other two waited outside. Magdalene, seeing the guard, stepped back at first a few steps toward Salom, then both made their way together through the soldiers lying around and into the sepulchre. They found the stone rolled away but the doors closed, probably by Crisius. Magdalene anxiously opened one of them, peered in at the tomb, and saw the linens lying empty and apart. The whole place was resplendent with light, and an angel was sitting at the right of the tomb. Magdalene was exceedingly troubled. She hurried out of the garden of the sepulchre, off through the gate belonging to Nicodemus, and back to the apostles. Salom, too, who only now entered the sepulchre, ran at once after Magdalene rushed in fright to the women waiting outside the garden, and told them of what had happened. Though amazed and rejoiced at what they heard from Salom, they could not resolve to enter the garden. It was not until Cassius told them in a few words what he had seen, and exhorted them to go see for themselves, that they took courage to enter. Cassius was hurrying into the city to acquaint Pilate of all that had taken place. He went through the gate of execution. When with beating heart the women entered the sepulchre and drew near the holy tomb, they beheld standing before them the two angels of the tomb in priestly robes, white and shining. The women pressed close to one another in terror and, covering their faces with their hands, bowed tremblingly almost to the ground. One of the angels addressed them. They must not fear, he said, nor must they look for the crucified here. He was alive, he had arisen, he was no longer among the dead. Then the angel pointed out to them the empty tomb, and ordered them to tell the disciples what they had seen and heard, and that Jesus would go before them into Galilee. They should, continued the angel, remember what the Lord had said to them in Galilee, namely, the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of sinners. He will be crucified and, on the third day, he will rise again. The holy women, shaking and trembling with fear, though still full of joy, tearfully gazed at the tomb and the linens, and departed taking the road toward the gate of execution. They were still very much frightened. They did not hurry, but paused from time to time and looked around from the distance, to see whether they might not possibly behold the Lord, or whether Magdalene was returning. Meanwhile Magdalene reached the coenaculum like worn beside herself, and knocked violently at the door. Some of the disciples were still asleep on their couches around the walls, while several others had risen and were talking together. Peter and John opened the door. Magdalene, without entering, merely uttered the words, They have taken the Lord from the tomb. We know not where, and ran back in great haste to the garden of the sepulchre. Peter and John followed her, but John outstripped Peter. Magdalene was quite wet with dew when she again reached the garden and ran to the tomb. Her mantle had slipped from her head down on her shoulders, and her long hair had fallen around loose. As she was alone, she was afraid to enter the sepulchre at once so she waited out on the step at the entrance. She stooped down, trying to see through the lower doors into the cave and even as far as the stone couch. Her long hair fell forward as she stooped, and she was trying to keep it back with her hands, when she saw the two angels in white priestly garments sitting at the head and the foot of the tomb, and heard the words, Woman, why weepest thou? She cried out in her grief, They have taken my Lord away. I know not where they have laid him. Saying this and seeing nothing but the linens, she turned weeping, like one seeking something, and as if she must find him. She had a dim presentiment that Jesus was near, and even the apparition of the angels could not turn her from her one idea. 
She did I not appear conscious of the fact that it was an angel that spoke to her. She thought only of Jesus. Her only thought was, Jesus is not here. Where is Jesus? I saw her running a few steps from the sepulchre and then returning like one half distracted and in quest of something. Her long hair fell on her shoulders. Once she drew the whole mass on the right shoulder through both hands, then flung it back and gazed around. About ten steps from the sepulchre and toward the east, where the garden rose in the direction of the city, she spied in the grey light of dawn, standing among the bushes behind a palm tree, a figure clothed in a long, white garment. Rushing toward it, she heard once more the words, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She thought it was the gardener. I saw that he had a spade in his hand and on his head a flat hat, which had a piece of something like bark standing out in front, as a protection from the sun. It was just like that I had seen on the gardener in the parable which Jesus, shortly before his passion, had related to the women in Britannia. The apparition was not resplendent. It looked like a person clad in long, white garments and seen at twilight. At the words, Whom seekest thou? Magdalene at once answered, Sir, if thou hast taken him hence, show me where thou hast laid him. I will take him away. And she again glanced around, as if to see whether he had not laid him someplace near. Then Jesus, in his well-known voice, said, Mary. Recognizing the voice, and forgetting the crucifixion, death, and burial now that he was alive, she turned quickly and, as once before, exclaimed, Rabboni. Master. She fell on her knees before him and stretched out her arms toward his feet. But Jesus raised his hand to keep her off, saying, Do not touch me, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren, and say to them, I ascend to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. At these words the Lord vanished. It was explained to me why Jesus said, Do not touch me, but I have only an indistinct remembrance of it. I think he said it because Magdalene was so impetuous. She seemed possessed of the idea that Jesus was alive just as he was before, and that everything was as it used to be. Upon Jesus' words that he had not yet ascended to his father, I was told that he had not yet, since his resurrection, presented himself to his heavenly father, had not yet thanked him for his victory over death and for redemption. I understood by those words that the first fruits of joy belong to God. It was as if Jesus had said that Magdalene should recollect herself and thank God for the mystery of redemption just accomplished and his conquest over death. After the disappearance of the Lord, Magdalene rose up quickly and again, as if in a dream, ran to the tomb. She saw the two angels, she saw the empty linens, and hurried, now certain of the miracle, back to her companions. It may have been about half past three o'clock when Jesus appeared to Magdalene. Scarcely had she left the garden when John approached, followed by Peter. John stood outside the entrance of the cave and stooped down to look, through the outer doors of the sepulchre, at the half-opened doors of the tomb, where he saw the linens lying. Then came Peter. He stepped down into the sepulchre and went to the tomb, in the centre of which he saw the winding sheet lying. It was rolled together from both sides toward the middle, and the spices were wrapped in it. The bandages were folded around it as women are accustomed to roll together such linens when putting them away. The linen that had covered the sacred face was lying to the right next to the wall. It too was folded. John now followed Peter to the tomb, saw the same things, and believed in the resurrection. All that the Lord had said, or that was written in the scriptures, was now clear to them. They had had only an imperfect comprehension of it before. Peter took the linens with him under his mantle. Both again went back by the little gate belonging to Nicodemus, and John's once more got ahead of Peter. As long as the sacred body lay in the tomb, the two angels sat one at the head, the other at the foot, and when Magdalene and the two apostles came, they were still there. It seems to me that Peter did not see them. I heard John afterward saying to the disciples of Amors that, on looking into the tomb, he saw one angel. Perhaps it was through humility that he forbore to mention it in his gospel? that he might not appear to have seen more than Peter. Now, for the first time, I saw the guards arise from where they were lying on the ground. They took their lances, also the lanterns that were hanging on poles at the door of the entrance and shedding their light into the cave, and hurried in evident fear and trepidation to the gate of execution and into the city. Meanwhile, 
Magdalene had reached the holy women and told them of the Lord's apparition. Then she too hurried on to the city through the neighboring gate of the execution, but the others went again to the garden, outside of which Jesus appeared to them in a white flown garment that concealed even his hands. He said, All hail. They trembled and fell at his feet. Jesus waved his hand in a certain direction while addressing to them some words, and vanished. The holy women then hastened through the Bethlehem gate on some, to tell the disciples in the coenaculum that they had seen the Lord in what he had said to them. But the disciples would not at first credit Magdalene's report, and, until the return of Peter and John, they looked upon the whole affair as the effect of women's imagination. John and Peter, whom amazement at what they had seen had rendered silent and thoughtful, met on their way back James the Lesson Thaddeus, who had set out after them for the tomb. They too were very much agitated, for the Lord had appeared to them near the coenaculum. Once I saw Peter, as they went along, suddenly start and tremble, as if he had just got a glimpse of the risen Saviour. After the resurrection, Magdalene, in her sorrow and love, was above all fear. She was perfectly heroic and without a thought of danger. She took no rest, but often left the house, hurried through the streets with streaming hair, and wherever she found listeners, whether in their homes or in public places, she accused them as the murderers of the Lord, vehemently recounting all they had done to the Saviour, and announcing to them his resurrection. If she found no one to listen to her, she wandered through the gardens and told it to the flowers, the trees, and the fountains. Oftentimes a crowd gathered around her, some compassionating her, others insulting her on account of her past life. She was little esteemed by the crowd, for she had once given great scandal. I saw that her present violent conduct scandalized some of the Jews, and about five of them wanted to seize her, but she passed straight through them and went on as before. She had lost sight of the whole world, she sighed only after Jesus. About one year after the crucifixion of our Lord, Stephen was stoned, though no further persecution of the apostles took place at that time. The rising settlement of new converts around Jerusalem, however, was dissolved, the Christians displaced and some were murdered. A few years later, a new storm arose against them. Then it was that the Blessed Virgin, who until that time had dwelt in the small house near the Coenaculum and in Britannia, allowed herself to be conducted by John to the region of Ephesus, where the Christians had already made settlements. This happened a short time after the imprisonment of Lazarus and his sisters by the Jews and their setting out over the sea, eventually landing in France. Before his ascension, Jesus had made known to Magdalene that she would live concealed in the wilderness and that Martha would was to establish a community of women. He added that he himself would always be with them. Amen. According to French tradition, Mary, Lazarus and some companions came to Marseilles and converted the whole of Provence. Magdalene is said to have retired to a hill, La saint born nearby where she gave herself up to a life of penance for thirty years. When the time of her death arrived she was carried by angels to iron into the oratory of St. Maximinus where she received the Viaticum, she was then laid in an oratory constructed by St. Maximinus at Villalota. Amen.